Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight, just a breezy little recap of the year and the cool stuff that I saw, played, heard, or smelled. 2022 is yet another year spent being ground to dust here in capitalism's endless death spiral, and a ton of atrocious things happened. But in between the terrors and the horrors and the indignities and the injustices, I did find a few things to enjoy and I would like to share them with you. Starting now. If you know nothing else about me, you know that they call me the last of the true gamers. I often say that I game not because I don't have a life, but because I choose to have many lives. And folks, this year was a good year for games. But only one game can be game of the year. Only one game can stand out among its peers as the essential gaming experience among all the rest. Only one game's head befits a crown. And that's why my game of the year is a five-way tie. Norco is a cyberbilly point-and-click adventure set in a near-future Louisiana suffering under the boot heel of the petrochemical industry. Hard to imagine how that could happen, but there you go. I've already done a video on Norco on this channel, so I'll be brief and just say that this is a wonderful narrative-focused adventure with incredible retro graphics, great music, and a really compelling setting. The American Midwest and South are criminally underrepresented regions when it comes to cyberpunk and sci-fi, so I really enjoyed what Norco brought to the table. Next up is Citizen Sleeper. In this game, you play as an automaton powered by a digitized human mind and used for slave labor. You escape your slavers and try to make a life for yourself on a space station while avoiding capture and trying to slow down a corporate-created virus designed to kill escaped property. What I loved about Citizen Sleeper, besides the sharp writing, is the way that the gameplay mechanics perfectly match to the themes of the game. Each day in the game, you're given a certain number of dice you can spend on tasks that might earn you money, build relationships, or investigate mysteries. But at the beginning, when you're broke and can't even afford food, you only have a few dice to spend. You may have to use your time on work instead of rest, worsening your condition, which in turn depletes your dice pool, which in turn means foregoing something you need in order to save up for something more urgent. The crushing cycle of poverty is perfectly realized in the gameplay, and it's a genius way to help tell a story about exploited populations eking out their lives in a corporate hellscape. Immortality is a totally unique gaming experience, and it contains at least two of the greatest performances I've ever seen in a video game. The game involves you piecing together the three lost films starring actress Marissa Marcel. One is a 60s horny monk movie, one is a 70s art cop murder mystery, and one is a 90s body double thriller. As you piece together the unprocessed footage, you begin to learn more about the life of Marissa Marcel, and you begin to discover that something strange is going on. The entire story of immortality is told through the performances as well as the odds and ends that happen at table reads, rehearsals, cast events, and the occasional interview. Well, I should say the public story is told through these clips. There's another story, but you'll have to figure out how to tell it. All I can say is that Man and Gage as Marissa Marcel is just otherworldly. Her performance in this game is like top five of any actor in any medium for me. And as if that weren't enough, Charlotte Malin's performance as uh, someone else threatens to steal the show at almost every turn. Immortality is not an exciting game full of action and reflex. It's a slow, contemplative process of reviewing footage, finding new footage, and piecing things together in your own mind. Cinema fans are going to love this. And we have Pentiment. It concerns an artist for hire at a 16th century Bavarian abbey who finds himself caught up in a murder mystery. As you investigate the mystery, you'll have to choose which leads to follow because you can't work them all. You'll also have to decide how you want to present your findings because anything you say might get someone executed. The game then continues over a couple time skips as you revisit the town again and again to see how your choices affect the people. The art style is gorgeous, the writing and attention to detail are delicious, the choices feel meaty and interesting, but what I really responded to was following this tiny Bavarian village over approximately 25 years and seeing how my decisions and my mistakes changed lives. 
This game is about a lot of things, particularly how the present is always built on the ruins of the past, but I was really moved by watching these hardworking nobodies constantly jostled by decisions made outside their control. I may talk about this game later in depth, but suffice it to say, I think Pentiment was really special. Hmm, was there another game out there that I really loved? Something that I put 300 hours in across five playthroughs? No, it wasn't Stray, that game was just okay. No, Chicory was amazing, but it came out in 2021. It's definitely a sleeper hit that everyone should play, but it's not the game that I'm thinking of. I don't know, maybe it'll come to me by the end of the video. Some have called Hollywood the dream factory, one that manufactures that indescribable feeling you get when the lights begin to dim, and we go somewhere that we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn together. Dazzling images on a huge silver screen, sound we can feel. Somehow heartbreak feels good in a place like this. Our heroes feel like the best part of us, and stories feel perfect and powerful. And in 2022, they were. This year had some banger films come out, and I think it was a particularly good year for horror and thriller fans. But before I get to that, I gotta say it. I loved Jackass Forever. I grew up watching these guys, so there's definitely an element of nostalgia when I see Johnny Knoxville getting punched in the dick. But there was something else about this film that I really responded to. These dudes are actually really kind and caring towards each other. I know that doesn't seem obvious when they shoot fireworks into each other's butts, but... There's a tenderness that I sense between them. The pranks can be gross and painful and even dangerous, but they never feel cruel. I don't know how to explain that, it's just how I feel. Special shout out to Deep Water, the Ben Affleck, Anna de Armas erotic thriller. I love a good 80s or 90s erotic thriller, and they just don't make them like that anymore. Deep Water wasn't amazing, but it was sometimes very sexy, and I think we need to celebrate that when it happens. Anyway, Watcher, voyeuristic thriller, whipped ass. Bodies, 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 Zoomer Slasher, Whipped Ass, Crimes of the Future, Cronenberg Anti-Corporate Body Horror, Whipped Ass, Nope, Jordan Peele does a UFO movie, Whipped Ass, New Hellraiser, Trans Pinhead, Fuck Yes, Whipped Ass, Prey, Indigenous Predator movie, Whipped All Kinds of Ass, Barbarian, Detroit Core Airbnb Thriller, Whipped a Disgusting Amount of Ass. Everything Everywhere All at Once was basically a perfect movie. If you haven't seen it, you won't see heaven. I'm so sorry. As for my favorite movie this year, I actually have a weird pick. In 2022, Ty West and company released X, a riff on Texas Chainsaw Massacre about some people trying to shoot a porno film at a spooky farm and getting murdered. Months later, West released a prequel called Pearl. As someone who loved X, I was kind of skeptical about this because the film works really well as a standalone story. It didn't need a prequel at all, and I was prepared to be disappointed. Whoops, nope, Pearl is my favorite movie of the year. Everything in this movie fucks. The set design, the camera work, the writing, the lighting, Mia Goth's performance, are you kidding me? Imagine a movie shot like a golden age Hollywood spectacle, but suffused with this elusive, oily menace in every scene. If X was a riff on Texas Chainsaw, Pearl is a thriller riff on The Wizard of Oz. And man oh man, I have just never seen anything like it. I tried to up my reading in 2022, and while I'm not back to my book a week 20s, did read some really cool stuff this year. What's the Use by Sarah Ahmed is one I did a whole video on, but even so, I keep thinking about it long after. The book invites us to think about how things are used, everything from roads and mailboxes to complaint procedures in our own bodies. In so doing, we can see who is the intended user, who was meant to succeed, who wasn't considered during design, and what sort of outcomes the designers wanted to encourage. Once this kind of analysis clicks in your mind, you'll find yourself doing it everywhere, on everything, and drawing some pretty surprising conclusions. How to Blow Up a Pipeline by Andreas Malm is another one that I did a video on, the Norco video I referenced, and I found that pretty influential. It's not an actual how-to book, but it is an examination of how nonviolent activism is often supported from the shadows by militant activists. It's a sobering look at climate change and really demands that you answer a thorny question for yourself. If millions of lives are at stake, what sorts of actions are off-limits to save those lives? That question is only going to get more important as the years go on. 
The Weird is not a political book, but it's a, a giant collection of weird fiction. If you're intrigued by H.P. Lovecraft's strange tales, but you're skeeved out by him being a gross racist, this collection of weird fiction is perfect for you. Lots and lots of bizarre and unique stories from several different countries across almost a century. It's got thrills and chills, funny stuff and wild stuff, and just some damn good spooky stories. It's fun for the whole family. And right now, I'm midway through Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine. And it might be the most mad I've ever been reading a book. Klein documents in harrowing detail how the forces of capitalism rely on disasters and atrocities to break apart societies and reform them into loyal market economies ripe for exploitation. I knew the United States had influenced right-wing violence in Latin America, but I had no idea how deep that went and how unforgivable our actions were down there. I started this about a month after Blood in My Eye, which is an incredible series of letters written by George Jackson in prison. And between the two of these books, I'm like one bad week away from declaring As for music, well, did a whole dang video on the stunning and angrily political hip-hop punk of Bob Villain, so go watch that video and go check them out. I've also been enjoying the new Backwash album, His Happiness Shall Come First Even Though We Are Suffering. Absolutely relentless industrial horror hip-hop with some really poignant and painful personal reflections underneath it all. Other than that, I don't know, the new Metric album was pretty good. Um, been getting back into like drum and bass mixes. Honestly, I listened to a lot of Jippy's beat tapes and haircuts for men while cooking this year. Let's see, what else? Okay, you know what I've really been enjoying this year? Any Austin's videos about skyboxes and odd, unremarkable places in old video games. If any Austin is a chud or problematic, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about that. I just know that his videos are a nice little oasis of chill absurdity in a sea of chaos. <sighs> Man, what else was good this year? Um, AEW had like 50 wrestling matches that were all some of the best wrestling I've ever seen in my life, so that was pretty cool. Oh, you know what's good? Trader Joe's has a vegan beefless bulgogi that I think is pretty incredible. It's got a good texture, got a good flavor. If you live near Trader Joe's and you're living that plant-based lifestyle, you should check it out. <sighs> Was Wordle this year? Pretty proud of my Wordle performance. Oh, did I promise to talk about good smells this year? I got a good one for you. Check this. Three parts lavender oil, two parts clove oil, one part each of pine and bergamot oil. Mix it all up, diffuse that shit, smells like a mysterious witch's grove, you're welcome. Well, okay. I'm actually pretty happy with my channel performance this year. I just about doubled in size, so that was awesome. Inching ever closer to that fucking play button trophy, baby. Looking back on my output this year, I'm once again happy with the variety on display and my total unwillingness to capitalize on momentum or chase a more defined brand. I love that you all show up no matter what strange idea I'm fixated on. Well, some of you do. 2022 was an exhausting year for a lot of people, myself included. I spent a lot of it in various states of anger and nihilism and sorrow and bitterness. But in spite of it all, this channel has remained a lot of fun. I'm really happy with all my irregulars. You're all very kind and thoughtful. And I think for the most part, you all treat each other pretty well. I never had a moment this year where it felt like doing this channel was a chore or where it felt like I was just kind of going through the motions. I've always felt like I had the freedom to make whatever I want and put it out whenever I feel like it. It's a big reason that I have not dipped into Patreon, actually. For me, making videos is something relaxing, something that recharges me. And you out there watching are a big part of that because you don't act like assholes in my comments as far as I know. So thank you. So what's next for 2023? I don't know. I seem like a guy with a plan to you. Probably gonna make more videos. Probably going to do more poetry, maybe even out of spite. Maybe me and Scum Alice will do another atonal drone music video, and this time it'll be a fucking hour. In all seriousness, I anticipate that 2023 will see videos on a variety of topics. Some educational, some just for fun, and some may be trying to change the world in some small way. Thank you for another fun year together. I hope it ends on a high note for you. If you celebrate holidays, I hope they're happy. And if you don't, I hope you get some nice rest and rejuvenation going into 2023. Appreciate your time. Hope to see you on the next one. Absolutely.